all this is dr mubeen sayed from drbeen.com welcome to one more show so before we go into the depths of this discussion this topic i want to have you please remember levo arginine levo citrulline resveratrol any anti inflammatories and even corticosteroids sometimes and the anti diabetics and anti vegf vascular endothelial growth factor blockers these are generally the drugs that are seen or used when there is endothelial dysfunction there are more drugs as well for example uh, bh4 which is a hundred thousand dollars a year course so we're not talking about bh4 here but the other please keep them in your mind when we go over this discussion i wanted to make sure that the solution is present before we talk about the problem all right so in the description of this video there is a link to drbean.com this page that you're seeing and look at the price this is a one time prize to get access to dr bean with all the previous videos and all new premium videos that are being uploaded and this is a one time prize it's not a recurring or monthly subscription it's just one time entry to the club so take advantage of that now some of the links here endothelial dysfunction in covid-19 an overview of evidence biomarkers mechanisms and potential therapies all of these links in the same order are present in the description of this video as well this is a very beautifully done paper what they have done is they have collected all other papers and put them together so if you wanted to understand what kind of damage and here when they say covid they have looked at endothelial damage because of for example n protein of covid as well however the spike protein part is going to be applicable for covid or vaccine both so beautiful paper then there is another paper here sars-cov-2 spike protein induces degradation of junctional proteins that maintain endothelial barrier and then there are tons of other papers that i have included this one is also very important sars-cov-2 spike protein impairs endothelial function via the down regulation of ace2 and then if you go this is mitochondrial dysfunction this is the spike protein induces endothelial inflammation and you can continue on and see that there are a bunch of studies so with this let's start so my thought was first to go over the whole discussion in depth but i think that would take a lot of time so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do two talks today this is going to be the first one where i would provide an overview of extent of damage that occurs to endothelium because of spike protein and then we would come back live and do one more talk where we'll go in depth of each one damage and see what does that mean in terms of clinical outcomes so if that is good for you please let me know and let's start so this is a little spike protein and that spike protein is standing atop an endothelial cell these you can say are the receptor binding motif that is bound to ace2 and the endothelial cell if you see here this i made for a reason reduced nitric oxide release and more expression of cell adhesion molecules that is at the end of the day the primary problem that is responsible for every other problem less nitric oxide production and more expression of cell adhesion molecules okay continuing these are gifts for humanity and they are continuing welcome this is the study that i'm going to discuss primarily here is the summary so the whole talk today the first one is summary and even the summary is so elaborate it has so many factors that that would take some time so let's look at it we know that a sars-cov-2 spike protein has an s1 unit which has 
receptor binding domain and receptor binding motif. And it has a S2 unit as well. So we are talking primarily S1 unit and RBM and RBD. Some of these studies that I was showing actually just used S1, not even the whole spike protein, and they were able to see endothelial dysfunction. That means that S1's binding with the S2 itself is a problem. There is also another problem, and that is the endothelial cells, just like all other cells, but primarily endothelial because endothelial cells are facing the blood circulation. These endothelial cells are like the river bed. They are slippery. They have to be slippery. Otherwise, the flowing blood cells and the proteins in them will start getting stuck on the endothelial cell. So endothelial cells have a slippery surface on them that is called glycocalyx. That glycocalyx can actually trap spike proteins as well and which can cause local inflammation as well. So it's not just the ACE2 binding. It's also the glycocalyx trap entrapment which can cause issues as well. So keep that in mind as well. So here, if you see, this is an endothelial cell, which has a spike protein bound to it, and the endothelial cell is saying help. Although the astute readers, we, viewers would say, well, this is not really an endothelial cell because endothelial cells are, are flat cells and they look like a fried egg, and this is a rounded cell. So forgive me for that. Um, let's continue. Now, what happens is when spike protein binds with ACE2, when spike protein binds with ACE2, it's not necessary that it has to be whole SARS-CoV-2. It is not necessary that it is the virus has entered the cell, just the binding of the spike protein. And how do we know? The studies that I have referred here, many of those studies have actually a pseudo virus. That means a virus that only has a spike protein on it. They used that or they used neutralized weakened virus so that the effect of the virus infectivity is gone and they can only observe the spike protein, just the spike protein. And these effects were observed. Okay, so what are these effects? First one, let's start from this side. We know that when the spike proteins are binding with ACE2 and the ACE2 becomes, become occupied, then the S1, ACE1 and ACE2 balance is thrown out. This is a discussion we've been doing for two and a half years now. When ACE1 works or ACE enzyme works, that creates angiotensin 2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. Please keep in mind today the vasoconstriction or the narrowing of the blood vessels will be a very common discussion point. And that has its own effect, including increased blood pressure, plus also reducing blood flow. And that would cause organ damage, tissue damage. So when ACE1 is working, and ACE2, which counterbalances the function of the ACE1, ACE2 converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. Angiotensin 1 to 7, the ACE2's function, is actually anti-inflammatory and pro-vasodilatation. So when ACE2's function is not available and ACE1 function is present, that causes vasoconstriction. That in itself is an abnormality sufficient to cause disease. So ACE1 and ACE2 imbalance occurs. That causes inflammation because ACE1's substrate is pro-inflammatory, which also causes vasoconstriction, which would have its own issues. Thus, ACE1 and ACE2 imbalance also causes down regulation of ACE2. What happens is that when the spike protein is attached to the ACE2, then this complex, the spike protein and the ACE2, they both are brought in. And they both are not just these two brought in. The proteins on the cell surface that are nearby are also pulled in with this complex. This is like, you know, that uh, pit that appears in the land. Sometimes a whole house falls in it. And then there are more houses nearby and they start tilting inwards as well. And sometimes multiple houses or multiple trees fall in that little land pit that appears. Similarly, imagine there is a pit that appears and this thing is going down inside and it would pull the neighboring proteins as well. We have never talked about this before. This is a very, very important mechanism. So when those extra proteins are pulled in, what are those proteins? We have VE cadherins, PCAM1, GAM1, 
an Exene 43. And again, the medical professionals or students, nursing students, and PSPs, they would find out that these are cell adhesion, sorry, the cell to cell junctional proteins. What does that mean? Look, endothelium is a very delicate surface. It has to prevent blood from leaking outwards and blood particles and the proteins and the cells from leaking out. So the endothelial cells are very tightly aligned with each other and they're sealed together. That sealing together <laughs> and Dania says Dr. Bean has had some coffee from not from Starbucks. Yes, so I am nowadays only taking Pete's coffee and that also at home. So when the when the endothelial cells are, are sealed together, they prevent the things to just willy-nilly go out of the cell, uh, sorry, blood circulation and into the tissue uh, or things from the tissue coming into the blood vessels. However, these proteins are the ones that stitch them together. And can you imagine this? that when the spike protein binds with the ACE2 and the complex is internalized or invaginated or downregulated, these extra protein get downregulated as well. That's what would happen. When the proteins that are stitching the cells disappear from the surface of the cells, then the cells are not stitched together anymore. That causes the cells to retract from each other. That causes gaps to appear between the cells. That increases the permeability of the cell. That causes the barrier functions to break down. Barrier function breakdown is a huge problem. Blood-brain barrier, blood thymus barrier, blood testis barrier, many other barriers. So barrier function are at risk because of the spike protein, either from the vaccine or from the virus attaching to the endothelium. Just the spike protein. Okay, so continuing, I promise you I'll go through this fast, then we can go in depth in the second discussion. Now, when the spike protein binds with the ACE2, internally, there are changes in the cell. Why are those changes? Please remember that the receptor, ACE2 is an enzyme present on the surface of the cell. It is a receptor. When a receptor is stimulated, triggered, or a substrate binds with it, then there is a secondary messenger inside the cell. There is an effect inside the cell. This is like somebody pressing the button for, let's say, your bell at home and then there is a bell that goes on inside and then somebody goes and responds. So th that is called a second messenger system. So when the ACE2 is occupied, that causes, number one, reduced mitochondrial function. I'll go over a brief part of what does that mean a little later. But please remember, if the mitochondrial function is reduced, that would mean the cell would get into a pro-inflammatory state that would mean cell would do less respiration. That would mean cell would produce more reactive oxygen species. That would mean the cell is itself in trouble. So what do you do? Melatonin is an important one. Then near infrared is another important uh, uh, solution. So there are solutions as well, but please remember this is what happens. Mitochondrial, mitochondrial function is reduced. Then increased glycolysis, the production of energy is needed. Why? You'll see that a little later, that when the spike protein binds with the ACE2 and nitric oxide production is reduced, then the cell starts producing a lot of reactive oxygen species, and that needs a lot of energy. So the ATP usage increases. Plus, when there is mitochondrial dysfunction, reactive oxygen species are being produced very fast. And once again, ATP is produced or needed. So because of that, the nutritional molecules are used. So glycolysis starts as well. And the bad part of the glycolysis is once again, production of reactive oxygen species, which would cause inflammation, which would cause cell destruction or cell damage, or at least the pathology of the cell then this is a very important one. 
reduction in enos activity or enos decoupling or uncoupling what does this mean enos stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase it is an enzyme that is present in the endothelial cells the function of this enzyme is to synthesize nitric oxide from citrulline what it does is enos takes electrons and moves them to citrulline uh, sorry arginine i said citrulline levoarginine or arginine it moves the electrons and that then arginine converts into citrulline then citrulline becomes arginine again and this cycle continues so enos has a very important role in helping to produce nitric oxide not only that enos when it works and it is coupled and it is producing nitric oxide it also produces or triggers the function of superoxide dismutase which is another enzyme that enzyme sod or superoxide dismutase causes the reactive oxygen species to be reduced so when the ace2 is bound with the spike protein that causes internally the endothelial nitric oxide synthase to function less when that functions less less nitric oxide is produced and more reactive oxygen species are produced because the enos is an in an uncoupled state sod is not working ros are becoming more now less nitric oxide means what in the blood vessel endothelium nitric oxide is such a huge and important molecule what does it do nitric oxide diffuses out gets out of the cell in which it is made so imagine if i am an endothelial cell and i made nitric oxide that nitric oxide would just come out of me that nit nitric oxide when it will come come out of the cell it will go in all directions so one direction is blood remember it is a, it is making the endothelial cells are making the surface of the blood so when something comes out of them that would go in the blood similarly on the other side there are smooth muscles so when nitric oxide comes out it goes to the smooth muscles the function of the nitric oxide on the smooth muscle is to relax them when it relaxes them the blood vessel dilates when the blood vessel dilates it keeps the blood pressure to the to the amount that is needed plus there, there is blood flow that occurs this is very important normally blood vessels stay in a dilated state especially the large blood vessels because of the production of nitric oxide so imagine for a second that that nitric oxide production has reduced that means the blood vessels smooth muscles are not going to be contracted that means the blood vessel will become constricted and vasoconstriction and blood pressure and all those issues would occur then what else happens when the sod is reduced then reactive oxygen species are produced which will cause inflammation reactive oxygen species are like little fire bombs and they would go and attach to lipids and carbohydrates and other products within the cell and damage them they are like little monsters that would go and chew at things so we'll have more that would cause internal cellular organelle damage cell membrane damage even dna damage then nitric oxide that, that diffuses towards the blood side nitric oxide that diffused in the blood it does a very important function and that is it keeps the platelets from aggregating with each other imagine there are children who want to hug each other who are playing and they just want to be with each other and nitric oxide goes between them and pushes them apart and says no you're not going to hug each other and that is how nitric oxide reduces the aggregation of platelets and now imagine if the nitric oxide is less that will mean there will be more aggregation of platelets that means there will be thrombosis that means there will be clot formation just the spike protein attaching to ace2 is giving rise to all of these things if we go here for a second towards the less vasodilatation less nitric oxide less smooth muscle uh, relaxation vasoconstriction would mean blood flow issues would mean blood pressure issues will also mean thrombosis so when the blood is 
passing through a narrow blood vessel it is passing slowly it is sluggish when it is sluggish and its components that are passing through the blood vessel are squeezed to each other because the tunnel has become narrowed then the chances of thrombosis increase chances of the platelets and other factors come together and attaching with each other increases and then of course tissue damage occurs when a blood vessel which is now constricted and then on top of this uh, there is pro propensity for the clotting what will happen is that the onward blood flow will reduce so the tissue any tissue can be damaged may that be brain or the liver or kidney or git or pancreas or whatever then nitric oxide does one more thing and that is usually enos endothelial nitric oxide synthase enzyme causes blockade or reduction in the function of nuclear factor kappa b enzyme and we know that nuclear factor kappa b is a pro inflammatory chain within the cells in case of endothelium when nuclear factor kappa b is active it causes the production of cell adhesion molecules or icams as we call them or vcams icams little molecules imagine if you are looking at my head and then i slowly produce a hand here which is to go and grab other things so the function of the nuclear factor it has many functions but one of the functions in endothelium is to allow the gene expression to produce cell adhesion molecules which will then express themselves on the endothelial surface and they would try to catch white blood cells or leukocyte which are pro inflammatory cells t cells b cells and other cells so when nitric oxide is present it reduces or prevents the production of unnecessary cell adhesion molecules so that the white blood cells the cops that are going through the inflammatory cells they just keep going they don't stop let them go let them slip away but if we have cell adhesion molecules expressing on the surface of the endothelial cell then a white blood cell that was going by it is going to catch that little cell adhesion molecule and stop there and the all hell would lose break loose because now inflammation is going to start there okay so continuing i'm trying to go fast on this thing anti spike antibodies so this is the direct nitric oxide there is another function of the nitric oxide when the nitric oxide is present in appropriate amounts then in our blood vessels there are circulating endothelial cells you'll be surprised you'll say what the heck we have circulating endothelial cells yes so our bone marrow makes endothelial cell parents all the time these little endothelial cells parents cells are circulating in the blood vessels wherever there is an injury to the blood vessel or wherever there is inflammation these cells because of nitric oxide's lack these cells the the parent of the uh, endothelial cell they will get stuck there and they will make either repair the blood vessels that need endothelial cells to repair itself or they will make new blood vessels which is called angiogenesis cancers have angiogenesis Inflam inflammatory tissues have angiogenesis this is one problem of the chronic inflammation that there are so many blood vessels that get formed that even if you remove the inflammation those blood vessels are still coming in with the nutrition which is unnecessary nutrition bringing to the tissues and causing congestion there guess what nitric oxide does nitric oxide causes these circulating endothelial cells to die to do apoptosis what does that mean that means a bone marrow says i think we need new blood vessels everywhere or somewhere there is going to be inflammation or there's going to be injury i'm going to send some stem cells there and when those cells are circulating the nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cells and keeps telling these cells to say go away we you are not needed here we do not need a new blood vessel here stop die but reduction in nitric oxide causes these cells to stop 
and start making new blood vessels. That in itself is a problem. Angiogenesis would cause more inflammation, tissue congestion, tissue, tissue function disruption. And just the spike proteins binding will cause enos to, to reduce, which will cause less nitric oxide to be produced, which will cause angiogenesis, which will cause VEGF production. Can you see this little thing and the outcome? Okay, continuing. Here, anti-spike antibodies. So, of course, antigen, the, the spike is an antigen, right? It's a foreign substance. Our body doesn't, does not like it. So, when it is present in our body, we are going to make antibodies to it. So, what will happen is that antibodies against the spike protein and the spike protein, they will be stuck to each other and they will be tumbling around in the blood vessels and in the tissues. So this antigen antibody complex, it is actually notorious that these complexes get deposited on the endothelial surfaces or at the barriers of the blood circulation system. Wherever these things deposit, again, I had promised I'll just give you summary and not the in-depth analysis because that would take me hours. Wherever these endothelia, these antigen antibody complexes deposit, over there inflammation will start. This is called type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. So the presence of spike protein on, for example, an endothelial cell or near endothelial cell would possibly cause, if the antibodies are present, the, the complex is to be formed and inflammation occurring because of the antibody-antigen complexes. Then, spike protein can cause immune system to produce antibodies that can cause mimicry. And that mimicry or antibodies uh, thinking that the spike pro there is another tissue in our body that looks like spike protein that may be heart tissue, blood vessel tissue, or some other tissue. Everyone has a different way of mimicking. So cardiac damage can occur, blood vessel damage can occur, other tissue damage can occur. Joint pains is actually an example of mimicry or complex deposition or local inflammations. So that is possible. Then anti idiotypical antibodies. Dr. Bill Murphy, who has been on our show a few times, he actually discussed the Neil Jenkins theory, which is called the network theory of immunology, where we have an antigen, for example, spike protein, and then we make an antibody against that, which is called the anti-spike protein antibody. Then we make another antibody against this antibody, which is called anti idiotype antibody. That is to, to clear these antibodies out. It's a physiological process. If there are medical professionals or students, this would be a homeostatic mechanism to clear away the antibodies that are produced. However, these anti idiotype antibodies can end up connecting and binding with the ACE2 as well and behave like a spike protein and do all of this that spike protein would do in the absence of spike protein by our own antibodies, which are anti idiotype antibodies. There is a cell trend in Germany company that does, and I have no commercial interest with them. I actually asked them to come and join us for an interview and they did not. They kept saying we will and they never did. So this is the total relationship I have with them. They do an anti-ACE2 antibody test, which is anti-idiotypical antibodies. So these antibodies produced from our own selves can act as, antibody, as spike protein. So that is an autoimmune type of a reaction and sustained until those antibodies go away. Okay, so continuing, this is this the immune antibody related issues with the spike protein. Then mitochondrial dysfunction. In the endothelial cell and other cells as well, when the ACE2 is occupied with the spike protein, that causes, might increase reactive oxygen species, which in turn plus increase ATP production, increased glycolysis, which in turn would cause more mitochondria to be formed because there is a need for more energy and mitochondrial fragmentation would occur. 
plus the increased reactive oxygen species cause mitochondrial disruption, which then cause mitochondrial disrupted state to result in production of inflammatory mediators. Whenever mitochondria are under stress, and spike protein puts them under stress, not through the reactive oxygen species, but directly as well. In one of the studies I read today, it said that the spike protein directly manipulates the mitochondria to disrupt it. And that study is linked here. So in these links, there is that study as well. Just search for the man word manipulate. So spike protein can directly attack the mitochondria. I'm using the word attack instead of man manipulate and cause the mitochondrial dysfunction and fragmentation when the mitochondria is under stress. Then we have a problem. Number one, mitochondria is supposed to work with oxygen and produce ATP for us. That is the respiration of our cell. Plus, mitochondria keeps anti pro inflammatory molecules in check. It does not let them be produced. However, as soon as the mitochondria undergoes a stress, it starts helping produce interleukin 1b, interleukin 6, interleukin tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, interleukin 8, and so on. This is not 1, 6, it's just 6. I'll just. Interleukin 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 8. Okay, so that is the mitochondrial dysfunction. And remember, these are pro inflammatory molecules, which will mean any endothelium where there is mitochondrial dysfunction would release this, these inflammatory mediators in the blood and, and the tissues, and that would attract the immune system cells to come and cause inflammation, and further disruption would occur. Okay, nuclear factor kappa B. This is another important molecule present almost in every cells. And this molecule's function is to cause inflammation. Normally, we keep it under check. There's a drug called ivermectin that also manipulates this. And that manipulation of keeping nuclear factor kappa B under check is used for ivermectin's function on skin and other such inflammatory diseases, for example, even in rheumatology. That has nothing to do with the worms and others. That is just CDC making bullshit things to cause ivermectin to have a bad name. But ivermectins, rosaceae, and other such anti-inflammatory functions are through the nuclear factor kappa B. So nuclear factor kappa B signaling is changed when there is less nitric oxide production or when there is ACE2 binding with the spike protein. What is the signaling change? The leukocyte adhesion molecules, the VCAM, and other expression increases. It is the function of nuclear factor kappa B to bring or help produce cell adhesion molecules and let them be expressed on the surface. Imagine if all of us, when we are walking in a crowded bazaar or place, we all have our hands extended and whoever passes nearby, we grab them and then we don't let them go. And all of us do that. There will be aggregates, correct? The cell adhesion molecules are like those little molecules that would be expressed on the surface of the endothelium and they would gra grab the inflammatory molecules and would not, um, inflammatory cells and would not let them go. That would cause the inflammatory cells to sit down there and cause inflammation. Enos, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, keep, keeps the nuclear factor K beta's function, kappa B's function in check. When Enos isn't functioning correctly, then NF kappa B's function increases. That causes cell adhesion molecules to increase. That causes leukocyte to stop. That causes inflammation as well. Then, if we continue, nuclear factor Kappa B is less check because Enos is not present or less present to check it, would cause coagulation factors to be manufactured in the endothelium cell, endothelial cells and be released. So we keep saying, why is there coagulation? Why is there clotting? And we, people keep saying, well, there are there is clotting because there is more fibrin and there is more more entrapment of the inflammatory molecules in them and so on. Well, there are actually factors being produced to cause clotting. In this talk, you have seen so many factors. 
if you inflame an endothelial cell, the clotting would start occurring. If you cause platelets to aggregate, the clotting would start occurring. And I remissed saying over here, sorry, not here, here, the platelet factor four, anti-platelet factor four antibodies that are produced because of the spike protein would attack the platelet and cause them to aggregate as well. So there are so many factors. Similarly, when nuclear factor KB or kappa B is increased because ENOS is not stopping it, then the coagulation factors are increased as well, which are especially TF, thrombosis factor, and the factor eight. They are also released. So there is no um, curiosity for why is the clotting occurring? Well, the whole blood vessel is inflamed and the and the platelets are being attacked and there are immune complexes deposits and there is a complement activation and there are clotting factors being released okay so continuing as said i would not talk too much so here are some studies just to look at this study is the spike protein of sars cov2 induces endothelial inflammation through integrin alpha 5 beta 1 and nuclear factor k kappa b signaling this is the Nuclear factor kappa B, I talked. Now let's look at one more thing. This is the study. Here, if you read this white line, it says, in addition, inhibitors of integrin alpha 5 beta 1 activation prevents these effects. What they're saying is that when the nuclear factor kappa B related clotting and, and cell adhesion molecule effects are happening, then if we block a uh, alpha 5 beta 1, then those effects go down, which also means that alpha 5 beta 1 integrin molecule also overexpresses and overfunction to participate in producing cell adhesion molecules and in producing the, um, what was the other molecule here, the clotting factors. Continuing. Now, a little bit about inos and enos, because this is really important. If you're going to, if you're a doctor here and you're going to manage your patient for nitric oxide or enos abnormality, please realize that administering nitric oxide, for example, inhaled nitric oxide is a bad idea. And the studies I've, I've connected, why? So let's look at it. Let's say there are two cells. This cell here is endothelial cell. And endothelial cell, this little fish swimming in this, is the enos, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. This is another cell, let's say respiratory epithelium or some other body tissue cell. The body tissue cells have inos, inducible nitric oxide synthase. They do not have enos. Enos stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase, so it has to be in the endothelium. Inos is present in the other parts, other cells. I knows when that functions, it actually is pro-inflammatory and pro-reactive oxygen species forming. Why? I knows is induced when there is a viral infection, for example, SARS-CoV-2, and it produces nitric oxide to kill the virus. So in addition to that, all the internal mechanisms that are triggered are pro-inflammatory mechanisms. On the other hand, enos, when that gets triggered, it is an anti-inflammatory mechanism. That's a huge deal because they both actually produce nitric oxide, but within the, fun within the cell, the outcomes are different. So, and giving nitric oxide, administering nitric oxide, because it does not reach directly to the endothelium more than the epithelium, so inos becomes triggered. So in general, what is the message here? The message here is that if you want enos to work more, and if you don't want the bad effects of nitric oxide in the other tissues, the pro-inflammatory effects, then instead of providing administering nitric oxide, you give levoarginine or levocitrulline or resveratrol or other anti-inflammatory molecules, but not nitric oxide. And here for your, uh, 
further information, nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species in the non-endothelial cells, they make peroxy nitrate, which would then cause carb and lipid structural issues and the cellular dysfunction and even DNA breakdowns and apoptosis of the cell. So it's kind of on the inflammatory side. But the e nose, on the other hand, it produces vasoprotective effect. It is vasodilator. It is bronchodilator. It is antithrombotic. It reduces the cell adhesion molecules. It dilates the smooth muscle. And it also reduces the proliferation of the smooth muscle. Do you know that we do not want the smooth muscles around the blood vessels to proliferate and grow? Why do we not want that? Because if these cells would grow and proliferate, this is like, imagine if our body walls continue to become thick and thick and thick, we'll get trapped in it. Similarly, we do not want the muscle cells to grow around the blood vessel. They'll trap it. And the blood vessel will not be able to function correctly. And nitric oxide reduces the growth of smooth muscle cells around the blood vessel. And of course, it reduces the apoptosis or the cell death. One more study. This is the levoarginine and COVID-19. Levoarginine is the substrate used for nitric oxide production by nose. Due to its ability to cause nitric oxide generation, which has been shown to be a major endothelial relaxation factor, able to increase vasodilatation and reduce arterial blood pressure, levoarginine has considerable potential in becoming a tool to tackle cardiovascular issues. So if you see here, this is also an important part where they talk about inose versus enose. The thing I just described here is the study for that. Levoarginine is a good product for helping nitric oxide. And I have no commercial interest with any levoarginine producers. The other thing is levocitrulline. What happens is that levoarginine is used by enos to make nitric oxide and then levocitrulline is produced. Levocitrulline then becomes levoarginine again and the cycle continues. So if you want more nitric oxide to be produced in the endothelial cells, then you give levoarginine or levocitrulline or resveratrol. And then here, induction of citrulline nitric oxide. So that is about citrulline. With this, one more thing and then we stop. This was a summary that took 43 minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, I think one request I'll make to you is, would you like this discussion for me to come back and do a deeper dive into, for example, when vasoconstriction occurs, what happens? When platelet aggregation occurs what happens or oh, this is sufficient for today now i want to quickly show a couple of things um, so this is the last study in the description uh, i wanted to also explain why diabetes control is important diabetics have their blood vessels inflamed. And so when you add spike protein on top of that, their blood vessels are already um, inflamed and then there will be further inflammation. So controlling the diabetes with whatever way you do is going to be important as well. So if you see here, renin angiotensin aldosterone mediation drugs. So you could give drugs that would reduce the renin angiotensin production so that the ACE1 versus ACE2 imbalance does not occur too much. Although there are many studies that have said it does not really work. But anyways, that is one possible target. Statins, the only benefit of the statins is that they can reduce blood vessel inflammation, but I have not really seen a lot of good work. There are some long haulers who've said that statins have helped them. Most of them have said no. So this may be actually useful for some. Growth hormone or insulin-like growth hormones, they may be useful. Resveratrol, levoarginine, and I do not know if they have talked about levocitrulline as, as well or not, but that is also useful. That's one. This is the last study in the description. And then I believe the second or third study, this one, the first study in the description, 
also has a huge panel of therapeutics. So this is markers and then there are therapeutics as well. So do you see here vitamin C for reactive oxygen species and even traditional Chinese medicines and uh, others. So if you see statins, ACE inhibitors, although I do not believe ACE inhibitors are useful or ARBs are useful, um, then SGLT2I, metformin, that is for diabetes, anti-VEGF, may be useful. But here is an important thing. VEGF or anti-VEGF's role is because there is less nitric oxide. So the first thing to correct is going to be nitric oxide correction. And for that, we have to have enose activity. And for that, we need levoarginine. So the starting point has to be levoarginine and reduction of the inflammation so that the blood vessel damage and the tissue around that damage reduces. So anticoagulatory, of course, uh, vitamin C, of course, then some other anti-inflammatory as well. It's not necessary to use them all, but they have put them all together from various studies. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, please like, subscribe, and share. In the description, once again, if I can very quickly show you, the first link in the description is to Dr. Bean's um, premium account. And there are more than 900 videos in addition to the YouTube videos that are present here. And we just keep uploading new videos there. Do you know that every day I try to do one lecture in the morning for Dr. Bean and then the second one here for YouTube. So we are working hard to offer value here as well. If you like, please uh, use that link to buy. And... There are other links as well. You can use PayPal to support this work. You can become a Substack member. You can become a patron, $5 per month, or you can become a YouTube purchaser as well for $2.99 or $1.99. All right, so I'm going to hang up now. And my question to you is, do you want to do one more deeper dive? And that would be for every outcome that we saw, what is the clinical ramifications or do we meet on Monday? Thank you very much. See you again. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. And please like, subscribe, and share.